you know, I've never had a chance to talk to you about this. Um, you know, I'll tell, tell your son, Troy, you know, my last year, Troy, um, I was dealing with some back injuries. We, we, our team was not very good. Uh, we ended up going five and 11 uh, that year. We weren't drafting very well. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Gear up for an unforgettable episode as we welcome Troy Aikman, a legend not just on the field, but in the commentary box as well. Troy, whose journey from a celebrated NFL quarterback to a leading voice in sports broadcasting encapsulates passion, insight, and an unparalleled understanding of the game. With a career that boasts three Super Bowl victories and a place in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, his transition to broadcasting has allowed fans to continue experiencing football through his expert analysis and unique perspective. Beyond the booth, he's a figure of resilience and dedication with stories that inspire and motivate a lifelong competitor with a drive and focus that make him the ultimate teammate on and off the field. Whether you've cheered from the stands or learned the finer points of the game through his commentary, this episode promises a deep dive into the life of a man who is so much more than just a football player. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Troy Aikman, what a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today. Let's start when you were a kid. I'm fascinated by your dad and the impact he had on you and your sisters. He was hard on you, but I know your sister rose from a nurse to the CEO of the hospital where she worked. And you are known for your fierce leadership of three Super Bowl championship teams. How much do you think your dad instilled those leadership qualities in you? And can you please Tell everyone the banana peel story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you might, I, I'm wondering who you got the, that, that story from, but um, yeah, my, uh, you know, my dad was, he's still with us. Uh, yeah, he, he was, he was tough. Um, he was a welder by trade and uh, he grew up tough. He grew up on a ranch uh, and farming in Iowa. and. You know, I've said it a lot. He he treated treated me uh, like a grown man from the time I was about six years old. And so, you know, with that, there's there's some good things that come from that. But you also give up a lot. And and I, you know, I gave up a lot of childhood as as a result of that. But I also, you know, Tim, when we when we moved from California to Oklahoma, I was 12 years old, and we we then moved out on a on a working farm, and and I learned work ethic and, you know, values and the things that, you know, I carry with me to this day. And so I credit my father for a lot of the successes that, that I've been able to enjoy. And I, and I don't know that it would have been possible, uh, otherwise. And, and I think that, you know, my sisters, uh, you mentioned the one Tammy, she's the CEO at the largest hospital in Oklahoma, St. Anthony's. And then I've got another sister who's also a nurse. And, and I, I think that, I mean, it was a different time, as you know, and you you realize what the expectations are. And we were all motivated uh, by him to accomplish whatever we set our minds to. You know, he would always ask me when I was young what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, and I only remember wanting to be a professional athlete. And he would constantly say, well, you can be anything you want. 
as long as you put in the effort and put in the work, but you've got to be willing to work. And so that was ingrained in all of us at a, at a, at a very early age. Um, the, 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 banana, the banana peel story, I, I think I'd, I'll leave that one for a different day for now. Uh, it's not, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's one that anyone's real proud of, but, uh, but suffice it to say that, that, uh, demands were high expectations were high and uh you know that's just the way it was when when you lived in ken aikman's uh household i was known for getting in fights at practice when you would confront your cowboys teammates for slacking off did it ever turn violent (laughs) tim i know all too well we've got too many mutual friends so i know what kind of leader you were uh on uh, not only your Falcons teams, but, but even going back to, to Syracuse. And, um, no, I, it, it never turned violent, thankfully, because there were times when, when I got, you know, when I would get pretty heated with some guys that were a lot bigger than I was. But I, I, I think that, uh, I, I just, I've, I've got a lot of great friends that I played with. I mean, I, I consider everyone who I played with a, a very special friend. And, and there were times, as you know, when you're in a locker room or you're in practice in a game, you know, tempers flare and there's a lot at stake. And I always felt that that my job was to do whatever I felt was necessary for us to be the best we could be and to win a game. And and so I I, I, it didn't matter who it was or, or what it might be. I, I just refused to let anything stand in the way of that. But uh, yeah, I can, I can thankfully say that none of, none of my tirades uh, turned into violence, uh, you know, which as you know, when you're in training camp and a lot of these tempers flare, it's usually between the offensive and defensive linemen that, that get in these scuffles. The quarterbacks typically aren't involved. And thankfully I never was either. Did you have more of that? Uh, and I guess as your career went through middle school, high school, college, and, and the pros, were you always like that, or did your standards kind of rise as you went through the through the different divisions there? You know, it's a good question. Um, it uh, it was in high school. I was that way. In college at UCLA, which is where I primarily played, I had a you know I played a few games at Oklahoma. Uh, that never really came out. Um, and then it didn't so much in Dallas. It came out mostly after Jimmy left. And, and I think the reason, you know, I think coaching matters and I think, and I think leadership matters. And, you know, I was one of those, everyone's wired a little bit differently. I mean, they're like, I would imagine a guy like Brett Favre approached things much differently than I did uh, during the week or on the practice field. And, I just wasn't real good at letting things just roll off my back and saying, oh, this is, this is, let's just have a fun time. And, you know, you know, that just wasn't, that's never been my style. So if it's important, then, then it's important. And we had, we had guys, uh, I mean, I don't have to name the names, but we had guys who like to get out and enjoy themselves when they left the facility. And, And I was fine with all of that, just as long as when we were at the facility and on the practice field that I couldn't tell that it was affecting the way in which they approached the game. Um, you know, Michael Irvin was one of the, arguably the, the hardest working guy that, that I've been around. So, you know, people always ask me about him. Uh, and I say, we got along great because he was a true pro. Um, but yeah, so when Jimmy left, things changed a little bit. We didn't have the guy who was who had his thumb on everybody. And uh, Jimmy and I, it was really more good cop, bad cop. So Jimmy would pull everyone up, and he would get on to everyone, yell at them, start practice over. And, and he would say all the things that I was thinking. But then I got to come in and say, hey, let, don't worry about him. Let's just go practice. You know, let's just – and then uh, when he left, then I, then I had to be the bad cop. You know, I couldn't just be the good cop. Uh, but that, you know, you do what you got to do. And I think that's part of being, being a leader. Who do people say you take after your mom or your dad? Yeah, I, I, I would say, um, I, I think I took after both my parents, Tim. I, I, I think, I hope this is right. My mom was a salt of the earth. She passed away about a year and a half ago and, you know, she was the nicest person I, I knew. 
Um, she was a great, great mom. She sacrificed everything for, for her children. Uh, and I think some of her softness, I, I do, I doesn't sound like it, but I do have a, a little bit of a soft side. So I think, you know, I'm, 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 I'm one of the, I feel things, you know, and, and Tim, from what I know of you, I think you do as well. And I, I think that, you know, I think I got that from my mom and then, and then I got this other hardened exterior, uh, that's driven me professionally from my father. So I, I hope anyway, I hope I've got a, a, a nice blend between the two of them. Yeah, I know. I, I listened to another, uh, interview you did with Joe Buck actually. And you were talking about your mom and the the role she played on your interest in sports and all that. It sounds like you guys had a really special relationship. Yeah, she she was, uh, you know, my father didn't get a chance to play sports because he, he was working on the farm, uh, you know, at a very early age. My mom, her brother was a really good athlete. She was always into sports. She would she would keep the she was a big Angels fan growing up in Long Beach, California. And then the time that, that we were there, she would keep the official scorebook uh in baseball while she was watching the games you know and then she watched the rams and then she watched the lakers those you know those the, those were her shows you know if you will some people are watching soap operas those were she watched sports and she knew she knew sports and so you know for a young boy that was athletically driven it was it was it was a great world for me to be able to come home and and have those conversations in fact you know what comes to mind very vividly w- when I think of her and 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 our bond over sports is I watched the Miracle on Ice, uh, the USA Olympic team uh, when they beat Russia. I she and I walked into the into the house when this hockey game was going on, and it was in the third period, the last period, and and she's the one who explained to me the relevance of this game and what was going on, and so I watched the whole last period. Uh, with her. And so anytime I, I hear, do you believe in miracles or Al Michaels or, or any of that, that call, it immediately takes me back to, to being with my mom watching it. Did you and her stay close as you got older? We did. Yeah. Yeah. Really close. Her health, her health began to fail her. Um, she went through breast cancer. She had multiple myeloma and, you know, but she was a battler and she hung in there. And, um, but yeah, we remained close throughout. She was really, st- really close to my sisters. Uh, she was the, she was the, the matriarch and, and really is the one who held everyone together. When you were just a young boy, you were set on being a professional athlete, baseball or football. Did you watch a lot of sports? Did you have any idols that you wanted to be like? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I thought, really, I thought the whole time I was growing up, I thought baseball was going to be my sport. I almost, I almost gave up football as a freshman in high school uh, when we moved to Oklahoma. But I was living in Cerritos, California until eighth grade. And a number of my buddies went on to play Division One baseball. Uh, some of them went on to play in the big leagues. Um, what, I would go to Angels games as a kid. I'd go to Dodgers games. Uh, it's interesting. I, I I was going to Angels games when Nolan Ryan was pitching for them, and then I got a chance when I when I was drafted by Dallas to watch the end of Nolan Ryan's career uh, with the Texas Rangers. And I've since I, I, I got to know him when I came to Dallas. And I I always say he's the he's basically the Roger Staubach of of baseball. You know, just an unbelievable person and. You know, great integrity and character, and but I was also a Rams fan, and Vince Ferragamo, uh, their quarterback, who took him to the Super Bowl in 1980 against uh, 79, maybe it was 79 against uh, uh, Bradshaw and the Steelers. Um, but yeah, so I, I had, I had uh, at one time I don't anymore. I had a few jerseys up. I had Joe Namath, Bart Starr. Uh, Staubach. The only current guy at that time was Peyton Manning. And then I had Vince Ferragamo and people would come over and they'd see it and they'd, they'd say, okay, I got it. I got it. They go, Vince Ferragamo. <laughs> Where does this guy Where does he fit into this group? And I say, uh, he's at the top of the list. I mean, that was my guy back when, back when I was growing up watching him. So, uh, those, yeah, those were the athletes were the ones that I looked up to for sure. When we were roommates, Brett Favre used to tell me that one day 
He overheard his uncle say to his dad, You know they don't come around like that very much. When did you know you were special? Did someone tell you that you had a great arm, or did you just know it? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, and by the way, if you've had Brett Favre on this, on this, I can only imagine some of the stories that I gotta he get, I got to uh, get Favre to come on and tell me some stories when they were roommates. I, I, well, never hear. I didn't know that, I, Tim, I didn't know you and Favre were roommates. I, 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 he, Tim knows all about Uncle Rube. I, yeah. Uh, I, I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, sports kind of came easy for me. Um, I, I, I say easy. I mean, it just was seemed natural for me. And so the, when I, when I played basketball, it, you know, I was able to shoot and do those things. Uh, I remember vividly there was a coach I had in baseball that was, and I was standing there cause he, this coach was going to give me a ride home that night or something. My parents weren't at practice. And so he was going to give me a ride and we were kind of hanging around after practice and he was talking to some other adults and, and I was probably 11, maybe 12 years old. And he said uh, that, Hey, we may one day see this, this guy uh, in the big leagues. And, and it's the, and he was referring to me and it's the first time that, you know, I knew I was a pretty good player. I mean, you know, that like yourself when you're, when you're, when you're growing up and you're playing, but it was the first real vote of confidence that I, I remember, I was a real humble, shy guy, you know, and, and I just, but it, but it, but I remember thinking all the way home going, wow, this, I mean, this guy, my coach thinks I'm really good, you know, and, and what a, what a boost of confidence that was for me. That's the first memory I have of thinking, Hey, maybe, maybe some of these dreams that I have, you know, aren't pie in the sky ideas. Did you have a backup plan? Uh, I, I really did not. Um, I, I, I went, you know, Tim, I wasn't near the writer that you are. And I wasn't, I, you know, you're a Renaissance man. I, I didn't, I didn't have any of those skills. I, 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 I've always believed though. I didn't have a backup plan even when I was playing for the Cowboys. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, reckless in, in that I didn't have a backup plan. I was going to, I was going to college, uh, if sports hadn't have entered my life, I, I really think I, my interest would have either been architecture or I, I might have, it's easy to say I would have been a doctor. Uh, my, my family's gone that route in healthcare and, and, and orthopedic surgeon was of interest to me. Uh, maybe I would have done that. But once I got into school, yeah, I, I didn't know what it was going to look like, Tim, other than you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be the best player I can be. I'm going to get an education and then kind of let the chips fall where they may. And, and even when I got to Dallas and you know that your career is not going to last that long, uh, I really didn't have a plan then as to what my future might look like. I just trusted that doors would open and, and, and good things would happen. It's just kind of been my, my philosophy of, of life in general. And, uh, so it's a great question. I, you know, had it have not worked out professionally, I I'm as curious as anybody as to where I'd be and what I might be doing. When you stopped with the Cowboys, did you think, I know you met with, um, I mean, you know, you met with Fox pretty shortly thereafter, but did you, were you thinking broadcasting or is that kind of out of nowhere? So, um, I don't know how it was for, for Tim, but when I was playing, it just wasn't in our locker room. It wasn't something guys gave a lot of conversation about. And, and we all, we all felt that Deion Sanders would likely go into television. We all felt that Michael Irvin likely would just because of their personalities. But beyond that, that, that was kind of it, but nobody talked about it. I think now there's so many opportunities that I think players now openly say, hey, they want to get into television. I, I had zero interest in doing television. I just, I would watch games and I would just think, man, how do people talk for three and a half hours? I, I just, I'm not, I'm not that, I, I don't talk that much, you know? <laughs> so I just, I didn't think it would work for me. I didn't think I'd be good at it. And then, uh, 
they had the they had the uh, World League, uh, or not World League, the uh, NFL Europe. And so, uh, Tim, I don't know if you did NFL Europe or not, but uh, you probably did. All I did. The, the Fox. I know Baldy was the king of uh, <laughs> the World League <laughs> or NFL Europe. And so uh, our pl- our play by play guy for the Cowboys, Brad Sham, uh, we were on a flight coming home. Del Hellestre, a buddy of mine, a teammate, had done NFL Europe. And I said to Brad, Brad, how come you don't go over to NFL Europe and do some TV work? He goes, well, I'd love to, but I haven't been able to, you know, get asked to go. And I said, well, Fox has asked me to go the last couple of years. Why don't we go? And I'll just say, I'll go, but you have to be my play-by-play guy for me to do it. And he said, that'd be great. So I reached out to Fox and said, hey, you've been asking me the last couple of years to come over and do a game. I'd like to do it, but I, but I really want Brad Sham to be my play-by-play guy. And they said, okay. And the reason I did that, well, I did it to help him, but I also went into the first game feeling comfortable that, like, I could not, like, if I decided I didn't want to say a word all the whole game, I knew Brad could carry the show, you know? So I went in with no pressure at all. And because I was doing it with someone I already knew, he and I had been doing a radio show together my whole career. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And then you realize that, you know, Tim knows this. Once you visit with coaches and you talk to players, well, now you've gotten way more information than if you just show up. So I, I found it to be a lot of fun. And then Fox said to me, hey, uh, you know, we like what you did. And when you retire, you know, we just want you to know that, that you know, we'll have an opportunity for you. And I said, OK, great. And then just a couple of years later, I did retire. And timing's everything. You know, Matt Millen was just leaving to go become the GM of the Lions. And he was the number two guy. And they said, they said, if you retire, and I was still trying to decide if I wanted to play, but they said, if you retire, we're going to put you in the number two booth. And, uh, and I, I thought it was a pretty good opportunity. But even with that, I didn't feel like I'd be doing it long. I, I really thought I'd do it a few years and then move on to something else. I always thought that I would work in a front office somewhere. That was, that was really my goal. Uh, and, and, and something I thought that that I would enjoy and would create a challenge. And I felt like having been a part of some championship team that, that I knew what that looked like. I knew what that locker room looked like. And I felt, and I, and I'll be honest, I mean, that time has passed me. I, you know, I can't imagine at my age now that I'd ever get an opportunity, but you know, I'll always wonder, I, I definitely will always think, gosh, I wonder if I could have been good at that. Um, and you don't know, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, I think I would have been, but, you just never know if you've not done it. I saw that you won the state championship for typing in high school. What is the story behind that? I am not much older than you, despite the white hair and beard. And that's when men were men and we typed on real typewriters. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's what I learned on. You know, my mom, going back to my mom, my mom was a typesetter at the local newspaper uh, in Henriette, Oklahoma, where, where, I, where I moved to. I, I guess maybe it's hereditary. I, I have no idea, but she did do that for a living. Um, so I, I was a sophomore and the best looking girls in high school were all in typing class, typing one. And I thought, you know, and I had room for an elective and I said, Hey, you know, that sounds like a pretty good spot to be, you know? So, so I took, uh, I took typing one and, and there were other buddies of mine. Uh, there were, it was kind of a mix between guys and girls. And I, I just excelled at it. And then the teacher had us had a brother who was one of the top high school coaches in the state. So I would finish up my typing assignment and there'd be 20 minutes left of class. I'd go sit up next to her at her desk and we would talk football the whole rest of the class. And I just loved everything about it. Uh, and my buddies are back there. They're kind of doing the finger thing. You know, they couldn't get the keyboard right. You got to wear these glasses where you can't see the keyboard. It was a disaster for, for them. But I enjoyed it so much that I decided to take typing two. Uh, and then my sister was a year ahead of me. So she was a senior in typing two. I was a junior. She was the best typist in the class. And they had this contest with all, it wasn't just for typing, but they did have typing. They had a business contest of some sort and all this, this, these different deals. And Tammy, my sister should have been the one who represented our, our class, but 
She said to me, she said, Troy, I don't really want to go. You know, I don't want to compete. You're an athlete. You're used to competing. You know, you take my place. And I said, okay, because I just figured uh, I'll get a day out of school. And uh, so I went and I'm in this this contest. I was the only guy in that in, in, in this contest in the typing class. And I thought I did okay. I didn't even think I really did all that well. So everyone did their test, you know, whatever the different subjects were that people were doing. And then we all met in this big auditorium and they announced the winners and they get to the typing award. And uh, I didn't think I, I didn't think there was any way that I won anything. And uh, then they, they announced my name. And uh, yeah, I will say that it was a little, I mean, it was a little, I was, it was a little embarrassing, you know, I'm walking down there winning a typing award with you know, all the women that were in that class. but. It's kind of taken on a life of its own, Tim. It was, I, I, I don't correct many people because I just let the, the, the story grow. You know how those things go. It was not a state title. It was like a, it was like a three county, a three county uh, deal, you know. <laughs> you know? When, I, when I go tell other people the story, I'm going to say you're the national champ. Well, that's right. I mean, it's, it's state champion right now. I mean, by the time I'm 70, it's going to be like a national title, you know, and then it's going to be international, you know, like so, <laughs> the North, yeah, the North was, America continent. Uh, and it might not even have been three counties. I mean, it might have been, uh, you know, two, two, two little towns. You know, I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Did your sister wish she went after that? She would probably would have won it. You know, she's never said she, you know, I, I it's, it, you know, that's a great question because I, she's never said. You know, that should have been my title or she's never said anything about that. We, of course, I'll be honest, we don't talk about it either. <laughs> yeah. She yeah. could have been the first national champ, right? That's right. That's right. I, that's what I need to tell her. Hey, you could have had a state title if you'd have gone. <laughs> <laughs> you played for some incredible coaches, Barry Switzer twice, Barry Donahue, Jimmy Johnson, and Norv Turner. What did each of those guys teach you that's carried over into life after football? Oh, man. Um, you know, Tim, those, those, the, all those guys you mentioned, obviously, great coaches. I was one of the lucky ones. Uh, I, I don't know about you. My guess is, you know, you might have been as well that had really good coaching at a young age. Uh, I think most of us that, that have gone on and, and, and realized our dreams, you know, I had – Right from the start, <clears throat> whether it was baseball, basketball, or football, from the time I began, I had really good coaching, and 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 it's why I wanted to continue to play. Um, and then those guys you mentioned <clears throat> were, you know, were all really good. I, I took something from all of them. Um, you know, Barry Switzer at Oklahoma. Uh, who I just saw, by the way, I just saw him last week. We were together. He's 86 years old. He looks phenomenal, um, moving a little slower, but you know, his memory is incredible. Uh, but when I got to Oklahoma, I was 17 years old and he had a, uh, <clears throat> he had a swagger about him, uh, that I think really gave the team a, 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 some confidence and elevated the, the play. You know, there, there were, excuse me, there were coaches I played for that worried about overconfidence and, and, and being overconfident if you were playing a lesser foe. Barry and Jimmy both, uh, they were cut from the same cloth in this regard that they, they, they never tried to get you to play down to the competition. They never said, hey, let's not get too overconfident. This team is capable, you know, of beating you. They would they would say, you know, if we don't beat Barry Switzer would say, if we don't beat this team by half a hundred, you know, I'm going to be upset, you know, and if this fifth string running back doesn't get in the game, you know, there's going to be hell to pay, you know, next week. I mean, and and Jimmy, Jimmy was the same way. You know, we'd be playing a team that wasn't I won't name who the team was, but they weren't very good. And uh, and and his message on Monday was. Uh, hey, sometimes you stand up here and you tell all the reasons why this is going to be a tough game. He says, we, we, we should blow these guys out. They're terrible. And uh, and so with that, I think, you know, it's a fine line, but it's ha it's in the delivery. And I think those guys were really good about it. Um, 
Donahue, I, I have, I, he passed away as well. Unfortunately, he, he's as good a person as anyone I I've ever known. He was just pure class, integrity, character. Um, he was, he could be tough, but just an amazing human being. And if, if I'm half the man that he is, and that sounds cliche, you know, I, I, then I've accomplished something because he, he, he's just such a, he was an, such an amazing person. And then Norv, you know, Norv came along at, at just the right time. As, as great as Jimmy was as a head coach, I, I'm not so sure we would have accomplished what we did, Tim, if, if Norv hadn't to come in as our offensive coordinator. He just, he, he, he was able to bring the, the whole group together, get the best out of all of us. He knew exactly what the strengths were of our team. The thing that he said that has always stuck with me, and I used it in my Hall of Fame speech when I was talking about him, <clears throat> is, you know, he, he, if I came in after a game and I didn't play particularly well and, you know, you're getting beat up in the press uh, through three interceptions, through the game-losing interception, whatever it might be, and it's, you know, you know how those weeks are the next week and you come in on Monday, you don't even want to watch the film. And, you know, he said to me, on more than one occasion, he said, you know, he says, these are the jobs that we have to remind ourselves that we always dreamed of having. And and I thought it was such a, you know, it, it's such a simple statement. But as I already said to you, my dream was to be a professional athlete. And so when he would say that, and I think it's true for all of us in life, that we we get to places in life that if if 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had said, hey, this is what you'll be doing, you know, we, we, we would probably have taken that. And, and then you get into the throes of life and you don't appreciate the things you have. And so Norv had been through a lot uh, in his personal life growing up, uh, didn't have really a father to speak of. His mom was battling multiple sclerosis, but he always, he always kept all of that in the right perspective. And I thought he had a great, besides being a, a great coach, I thought he was a really good human being and, and having that human element to it uh, when, in those times when you needed to hear it most. Was there a, was there one of those guys that, cause I know you, you mentioned earlier that you thought about doing some front office work, which obviously isn't coaching, maybe GM stuff, but one of those guys kind of pull you in that route. Did you gravitate towards that through one of them or just the, curiosity of kind of putting the pieces together in a team. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was playing, one of the reasons why I retired, uh, when I, I played 12 years and one of the reasons I retired when I did, I was having some back issues. So a lot of people think it's because of the, the head injuries, but it was really, I, I, I had a chronic, uh, back injury that just was giving me all kinds of problems. Um, and so that's, that's the reason I retired. In addition to that, however, was that there were decisions that were being made by the front office, uh, that I didn't think were giving us the best chance to win. And so I, and I, and that was, that was frustrating to me. I think you, you, you work hard to, to earn your peers respect. And I, I felt like I was at risk of losing that and and it was due to decisions that I couldn't control. And so I think with that backdrop is is why I I always then wanted to to be the guy making those decisions and putting together a team. Um because I th I think chemistry matters. I think the the makeup of a locker room matters. There are some who believe you just go get really great players, and then you go win. And I don't think it's that simple. We had guys that probably didn't contribute as much on the field, but they were major contributors into our success because of what they did in the locker room and what they did during the week. And, and you know, those, those glue guys are really important. Um, so that's, that was where that came from. Uh, but Jimmy Johnson – as good as he was as a coach, I, I think even he would tell you that his his real strength was evaluating talent. And what he's most proud of is that he put that team, that roster together, that that was able to enjoy that success in the 90s. 
And so he and I have had, we've had a lot of conversations uh, about putting together a team, you know, what kind of players was he looking for? What was important to him when he's evaluating a roster? Uh, all of that. So uh, if I had, if I had ever gotten, gotten into that side of things, uh, Jimmy Johnson would have been, uh, I don't know if he had been on the payroll, but he would have definitely been a <laughs> consultant to mine for sure. <laughs> and he is, and he is now to a lot of people. What's that? I'm going to put you on the spot now. If you were building a team today, we're going to test your GM skills on the fly. Hey, okay. If you're building a team today and everyone in the NFL is a free agent, you can pick one player. Who would be your first player, current current players? Uh, well, I mean, I think right now you'd, you'd, you'd probably – you'd have to go with Patrick Mahomes uh, at his age and, and, and what he's been able to accomplish, sure. uh, you know, the game in that regard has, you know, I think you've always had to have good quarterback play in order to win. But now, now even more so, but even more so, the quarterback has so much influence on the success of the team. You know, used to, like in basketball, you'd say, oh, well, if you've got Michael Jordan and you've got LeBron James or you've got Kobe Bryant, you know, then you can just kind of, you kind of fill in the pieces with the other four and 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 win a lot of games and win a championship. And and in football, I, I always felt that football was the ultimate team sport. I still believe that. But we're seeing quarterbacks, these elite quarterbacks like Patrick Mahomes, that are having the similar impact on our sport like like the great players are in basketball. Um, which is, which is saying a lot, you know, the way these games have come, but, but yeah, you know, Mahomes has been, what he's done is, is, is unreal. Incredible. Yeah. When did lifting weights become important to you before or after Mike Wysick? Because it's obvious that you're still doing it. Oh, Wysick. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you've talked to Wysick, but. I don't, you have, I, I'm, I'm sure Troy is like at the top of that list of fans of yours, but I, there, I don't know if there's anyone bigger than Mike Wojcik. And it's why it's Tim, you know, we've never talked about this. It's, I, I feel like I know you way better than I do. Like, I feel like you were almost a part of our locker rooms because of Wojcik, uh, and how much, you know, he talked about you all the time. I haven't seen Mike in a while. Um, but, I started lifting when I was 10 and uh, I'll never forget it. I asked my, my parents for, gosh, what was the brand back then? I don't know. It wasn't life fitness or I can't even remember what the name of the, you know, those old plastic weights that if you dropped them, they cracked and then the concrete come pouring out of them or whatever it was. So I had a bench and, and dumbbells. And so I started lifting, uh, as much as you can lift it as a 10 year old when I, when I was 10 and I've, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, and I still, I've got a trainer that, that doesn't train me as much as he just writes my programs. And, um, so I, yeah, I, I've never stopped, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 57 and, uh, I feel great. I would say I feel the best I've ever felt. But I said that once at the end of my career, and Babe Loffenberg, uh, who was a backup quarterback to me at one point, he reached out to me and said, you know, all that means is you're getting old because nobody young ever says they feel the best they've ever felt. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> uh, but no, I, uh, I, I still work out, still pretty consistent with it. And then uh, in the last few years, with all this biohacking and stuff, I, I'm, I'm borderline obsessed. Uh, with health and wellness. I do, I do, uh, I, well, I got my jug right here. I've, I, I drink a gallon and a half of water a day. I do red light therapy, hyperbaric chamber, uh, sauna, cold plunge. I, I, I walk 10,000 to 15,000 steps a day. I still sprint some on the treadmill. And, um, so <clears throat> I'm still doing it, but I, you know, it's not, it's not as easy. Not as fast or not as easy as maybe it was years ago. What got you into the the biohacking stuff? Just curious. You know, it's a, it, yeah. I, 
I, it was really mo- right around, you know, I, I was always lifting and doing that, but I think it was around COVID. Um, and I read, a, during COVID, I read a book by Tim McGraw, the country singer. And he was talking about his workout program. And it, it really kind of inspired me a little bit to say, you know, as I'm, I'm dedicated to it, I'm consistent with it. But, I, you know, I just felt like, man, I'm going to go all in on this. Like, I'm going to be as healthy as I possibly can be. I'm going to really, you know, I, I've always eaten good, too. But I knew people coming out of COVID were going to be, you know, most of them were going to come out worse off than they were. And I was determined not to let that happen. So that's kind of where it began. And you can't tell today, but I've I've had some chronic uh, red eyes, and I put drops in today before I went on this. But um, and I'm not real sure what's causing it. Uh, and so a lot of this stuff has been to try to figure out what's going on with this chronic redness in my eyes, and it's it's why I started doing red light therapy. It's why I bought a hyperbaric chamber. It's why I got cold fun, you know. So things are helping a little bit, but I still, you know, I, I'm running out of hours in the day. I mean, to get through all this, people say, hey, what'd you do today? And I say, well, um, you know, I answer a few emails and then, and, then, and then I think, what did I do other than all this biohacking, you know? So it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a lonely existence for sure. Let me, and let me ask this you too, just because we're on the topic. If you could only pick one of those kind of things, if somebody was listening to this and said, you know what, if it works for Aikman, it works for me. What was the one, what's the one of those kind of things you do out of sauna, hyperbaric chamber, red light therapy, all that kind of stuff? I, I would say two things. I, I would say two things. One, I would say the water. Uh, that's, that's what I started with. And, you know, I thought, <clears throat> I thought I drank a lot of water. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd grab a bottle of water and I'd, I'd drink it. I, I, you know, that's all I, if I'm not having a beer, I'm drinking water. Um, and so I thought I drank a lot of water, but I really wasn't sure how much. So when I was reading that you should drink so much. And I remember one time we were doing a production meeting with Tom Brady and he walked in with his jug and I was talking to him about it. And, and so I remembered that when I was trying to think, I wonder how many, I wonder how much I drink. So I thought this would be a good way to find out. And I realized I wasn't drinking nearly as much as I thought I was. And then when I made a commitment to drink it, you know, at that time I was drinking a gallon. Um, it's amazing how much better I felt. Uh, so that would be one. I would never not do that again. Um, and then the other one is cold plunge. It's, it's totally, uh, and I only take cold showers. I started two years ago. I take a cold shower first thing in the morning. Uh, I do the cold plunge at night before I go to bed, but I only take cold showers. Uh, I say only I've had three hot showers in the last two years. Um, and, and it's, <laughs> It's what changed. What, why, what I, made you break? I was so cold that I just thought I, I just can't do another cold shower. You know, I just want it. And then when you get that warm water, you're like, oh man, it's like the greatest feeling in your life. You know, so. Yeah. Um, but it's it changed my nervous system. You know, I would have <clears throat> I'd have low level anxiety, and it 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 really did. It it's it's totally changed my nervous system for the better. Um, and, and so that's what I would stick with. A couple of years ago, Coach Wysick turned me on to a man I hope you remember, Tony Evans. I think he was the team pastor then. He's now the leader of an immense Christian church whose ministry spans the globe. I start every Sunday morning while I'm getting ready for church with his sermon on YouTube. My question is this, what was your interaction with him, if any? And if not, did any of your teammates try to introduce you to him? Yeah, Tony, uh, Tony was not, he was not around to my knowledge. I hope I'm not wrong on this. He wasn't around when I was playing and I don't, I don't know him, Tim. I don't know him uh, really. I, I know who he is, but I don't have a relationship with him. I, I met him. If my memory's right, I met him uh, at Tony Romo's wedding. He he was at Tony Romo's wedding. Um, so yeah, I don't have I, I I don't have much interaction with him at all. And I and I I guess Tony does because he he was him and and one other pastor kind of oversaw the the his wedding ceremony. Um, and I don't know if Tony then got involved with the team. Uh, 
uh, it's, was he involved with the Cowboys then at some point? Is that what Mike was saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, that came, uh, that came after, after I had retired. So Mike, uh, when when Mike left the Cow- Mike Wojcik left the Cowboys following the '97 season, I believe, and that's when he went to New England. And all right, yeah, no, he no, he went to New Orleans. He went to New Orleans there with Ditka, and then he ended up going ultimately with New England, as you know, and won you know he won all his Super Bowl rings and and uh, along with whatever he won with us. And then he came back to Dallas when Jason Garrett became the head coach after I'd already retired. So that maybe that's when Tony came into the picture. I know that your coach, Jimmy Johnson, was a psychology major in college. And I've heard you say that he was a master at pushing just the right buttons with people. What I didn't hear you say was if he ever pushed your buttons. And if so, did you realize what was going on? Uh. Uh, oh, he pushed my buttons. All right. You know, Jimmy and I, Jimmy and I, we, uh, you know, Jimmy, we go back. I first met Jimmy. Uh, uh, Troy, I'll send you a, a photo. You'll get a kick out of it. I first met Jimmy when I was 14 years old and I was in high school, a sophomore in high school. And he was recruiting me <clears throat> at Oklahoma state. And, and then I was going to go to Oklahoma State, and I committed to Oklahoma State, but then I wanted to go to OU the last recruiting weekend, and I changed my mind and then attended OU. When I was transferring, Jimmy was then at the University of Miami. He was recruiting me to Miami. I went to UCLA, and then when I'm about to be drafted, Jerry Jones buys the Cowboys, fires Tom Landry, and hires Jimmy Johnson. So then Jimmy's back in my life you know, again. So, and and so I was excited about that because I I had known him for so long, and then he drafted Bill or uh, drafted Steve Walsh uh, in the supplemental draft same year I was drafted. So he drafted his quarterback from college, and it really put uh, it, it it created a, a kind of a wedge between Jimmy and I. Um, so th- and when, then we weren't winning. So that wasn't helping things. And and Jimmy and I had a tough start to our relationship. So uh, some of the buttons he hit were were not trying to motivate me as much as it just pissed me off, you know. So <laughs> but but in the button he did hit, Tim, is I had I heard we won our first Super Bowl in 92. And that offseason, I was in the weight room doing squats and I and I herniated a disc in my back and I had to have surgery and I didn't have the surgery until late June. So now we're getting ready to go be going to training camp and I'm coming off back surgery. And Jimmy, we were at an event receiving our Super Bowl rings. And Jimmy was talking to me and said, if you don't play in the preseason, uh, you can't expect to start week one. And and I remember thinking, you got what? I mean, I was upset. So I go to Norv and I said, hey, I just was talking to Jimmy. And I said, you know, he's saying he's saying if I don't play in the preseason that 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 I better plan on not starting week one. And 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 Norv is the one who said, Troy, I mean, how long have you been around him? He said he 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 knows He's just saying that so that you'll do everything you possibly can do to be ready to play week one. You know, I mean, that's just him. That's what he's, you know, haven't you figured that out yet? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's the, so that was a button he hit on me. I was incredulous to read that you don't consider yourself among the truly elite quarterbacks. Is that true? If so, why not? Um, no, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I, I don't know that I quite said it that way. What what I do know this, Tim. I know there are I know there are a lot of people. I, I don't think there are I, I there's always gonna be people within the league. I, I don't know that there's a lot of people I played uh with or against that don't feel that I belong in the Hall of Fame, but I do think that in a world of numbers that there's a lot of people 
who look at my numbers, my statistics, and would say, well, why is he in the Hall of Fame? I, 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 do, under, I do know that. Um, but I think what, what I'm most pr- – I'm, I'm proud of what we accomplished as a team, and I'm proud of my role in, in helping us achieve that. And what allowed me – you know, and I, and I know – what I what I sacrificed in in order to win. I, I never once complained about not throwing the ball enough. And a typical stat line for me was that I would be I'd be 15 of 19, 15 of 18 at halftime for 180 yards, and then we'd throw it four or five times in the second half, you know, and we'd close them out running the ball with Emmett Smith. And so, but we'd win. And, and, and I'd be thrilled with that. I never walked into anyone's office and demanded that we throw the ball so that people would, would think more of me or more highly of my accomplishments or, 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 uh, what I was contributing to the team. And the people that mattered to me, one, were those in the locker room and then the, the coaches and players that I played against. And I, and I do know that while I played, I had the respect of Bill Belichick and, Bill Parcells and Mike Holmgren and those type of people that I had great admiration for. And that was, that was enough for me. So I know that when they, when people, and and it's fair, um, when they list the top quarterbacks to have ever played the game, if they listed the top 10 to have ever played, there's very few people that would put me on their list. There are some, and and those that do are usually quarterbacks that really understand uh, what 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 I did. Um, but for the most part, I wouldn't be put on that list, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. It it doesn't like I'm not motivated by that. I'm not upset by that. Uh, you know, I was drafted, and this is the way I look at it. I was drafted to to win games and I wasn't drafted to throw for 4,000 yards. If that's what I had to do in order for us to win, then yes, then that's what I was drafted to do. But, but every player who's drafted is drafted to contribute to the hole that gives you a chance to win. And, and, and we won. And, and as a quarterback, when you're drafted in the first round, you're really drafted to win a world championship. And so I'm proud that I was able to do that and, and that we were able to win three of them. So the rest of it, Tim, is I think you and I are a lot alike. I really do. And I, and I, the rest of it's not relevant. Um, you know, my career I'm proud of, but that doesn't, but my football career is, uh, is just a small part of, of what I'm proud of. You know, I mean, I've said it before, uh, you know, I have two daughters and whatever I am or whatever my legacy is. Yeah. I mean, people are going to say, Hey, he won, but the, our kids, our, our children and our family, they tell our story, you know? And so I don't, I don't, I don't lose any sleep as to where I rank. Um, but I'm really proud of, of, of my career and, and, and what I was a part of for sure. It's so funny hearing like you two guys talk about it because I played division one, but never, never NFL, never even looked at, you know, not, not even in that same stratosphere as you guys and hearing like <clears throat> my dad will talk about it. Like, you know, if things had changed a little bit this way, a little bit that way, it could have been different. And you're saying like, if you had been in a, well, you're not saying it directly, but if you had been in a past happy scheme, you could have had more stats and maybe you win less games. Maybe not. Maybe you, maybe you do just as well, but it's just so funny. Like, you know, you're in the NFL Hall of Fame. My dad's in the College Hall of Fame. Like you guys had careers that think about kind of what Norv Turner said, right? Yeah. Like no, to, take, right. to take the criticism you're taking, I would love to say I was a 17th overall pick or the first overall pick, and and uh, I got a little criticism for it. You know, it's like it's just a funny. Uh, and my dad said to me, "It's kind of you're kind of echoing it, uh, Troy. It's like it's in sports. One of the things that's the worst things about sports is never enough." Cause like you can be, you can be, you can win three Super Bowls, and why didn't you throw for 5,000 yards? You can be, you know, Brett Favre played for however many years and just give it one more year. You Brady won six rings. Why wasn't it nine? You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's like such a unforgiving, uh, 
thing. It's beautiful. Sports are beautiful, but man, the yeah. it's just like it's like a drug. There's always you need just a little bit more. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you a real quick story because it's kind of relevant to what you're saying. That and it came up this last. It came up a few weeks ago after Patrick Mahomes won, you know, his third Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, this was, uh, I don't know, five years ago. I'm not sure exactly what year it was. Maybe four. What, he had not yet won a Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes had not yet won a Super Bowl. And I rarely get on Twitter. I rarely get on it. I rarely post anything on Twitter. I rarely, rarely read anything on Twitter. But one night I was, I was, I was just looking at my, my feed and, and some writer who had a big following. He said in, in his tweet, he said, uh, Patrick Mahomes, has thrown for like 80% of the total yards that Troy Aikman has, and he's done it in 7% of the games, you know, or something to that effect. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that he's thrown for all these yards, and he's almost thrown as many yards as Troy has, and he's done it in a fraction of the games that Troy played. Right. And it, it really kind of hit a nerve with me because, because of the reasons we're talking about. It's that who cares? Who cares how many yards anyone throws for? You know, I mean, that's not that's not why we're playing the game. And so so I I replied to him and and I said and I thought I thought it was pretty clever. I was I was kind of proud of myself. I, I replied and said, oh, he said he started it with in case you missed it. I I see why am I, you know, Patrick Mahomes is thrown for blah, blah, blah. So I reply and I said, I see why am I. Let me know when he has 33% of my Super Bowl titles, you know, and, and I thought, hey, that was pretty funny. You know, that's pretty clever. And so I send it out. Don't even think twice about it, although I'm kind of chuckling to myself like, you know, what a jack off like this guy. I mean, he follows the, the league and yet he thinks this is, you know, some big deal. And the next day, like this tweet had blown up and people took it as though I was taking a shot at Patrick Mahomes. And then I said, "Oh my God! I mean that I, that wasn't intended. That wasn't intended to be a shot at. Pa I think Patrick Mahomes is a great player. You know, I mean that had nothing to do with Patrick. You just it took had, him number one overall in our draft. It had everything to do with this jack off rider. You know, that thinks throwing for yards is relevant. And so I then reached out to Andy Reid right away and said, "Hey, Andy, I said, man, I don't know if you've heard anything about this or if you're going to get asked about it at the press conference, but here's what happened." I said, "In no way was I." You know, can you just kind of help me out here? And he says, oh, Troy, please. He says, I know you. He says, I, I, no one's worried about it, this and that. So it's, I didn't delete it either. I mean, I don't, if I tweet something, it's staying up, you know, I mean, it's like, I'm going to own it. And so yeah. it, it now, whenever he's, every time he's won a Super Bowl, <laughs> this thing surfaces back up again, you know, like I'm, yeah. and then you got all the Chiefs fans and all these Mahomes fans. They think I'm taking a shot at Patrick Mahomes. And so this whole world we're in, you can't, you can't fight it, you know. It's just it is what it is, and yeah, I just said it. Okay, and you just take your medicine and go on. But but that's anyway. That's kind of to the point. I had seen that. I, I I highly doubt my dad had, but I had seen that, and I was thinking about asking about it, and then I'm like, it's so blown out of proportion. Anyway, yeah. even if you did, even if you did mean as like a quip, which you obviously didn't. Yeah. It's still. It's like you said it. How many years ago? Like we got to move on because every time, like you said. Every time they win a Super Bowl, every time he wins a Super Bowl, that I see it somewhere. Yeah, and and I and he'll he'll win a fourth, and you know, heck, he he might, he might win eight. I don't know, and and if he does, great. I mean, I'm a big fan of Patrick, so it has yeah has it had nothing to do with Patrick Mahomes. Um, <laughs> it had everything to do with this writer. That, but that's you know this whole fantasy world we're in. That like. It, to me, it's it's about winning, and, and the quarterback gets a lot of the you know most of the credit when you do win. You know, I understand that, but you know, I, I can only imagine you know Tim, the ultimate competitor, what you might have felt like if you thought you were playing with a quarterback who was only interested in numbers. You know, and I, that, again, Patrick's not interested in numbers. Patrick's interested in Super Bowls. Uh, but but my reference was these writers. Like that's how you define greatness. Is is you know. The, throwing for yards or running for yards or touchdowns and you know it's 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 not important i mean what matters is does it does it help you win what made you retire do you ever regret leaving the game when you did because i believe that you had some gas left in the tank and could have easily pulled a tom brady and won another ring or two
Yeah, you're kind. I, I don't know if I don't know if we could have Tim. I mean, we were our organization was really in disarray at the time when I retired. And, you know, I've never had a chance to talk to you about this. Um, you know, I'll tell tell your son, Troy, you know, my last year, Troy, um, I was dealing with some back injuries. We, we our team was not very good. Uh, we ended up going five and 11, uh, that year. We weren't drafting very well. Uh, we didn't have a lot of structure, uh, with, within the organization. There was just a lot of the wheels had, had fallen off completely. And we were playing at home against San Francisco. And I knew I was married at the time. And I told my wife when I left the house to go to the stadium, I said, Hey, just so you know, this could get really ugly today. You know, I mean, there was a ground swell for me to be benched and, um, and, and I, I just, I felt what was happening, you know, that it was building to this crescendo that I was about to walk into the lion's den. And, uh, I said, so just, you know, just know that if, if things kind of come off the rails, just know I'll, I'm fine. I, you know, I'm prepared for it. And sure enough, the first pass of the game, there was a miscommunication with me and a receiver and the ball's incomplete. You could hear the air get taken out of the stadium. Like this, this was a crowd ready to just go crazy booing your dad was calling the game and uh and I got booed I got it's the only time at Texas it's the only time at Texas Stadium uh I mean they 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 were booing loudly they wanted me out of the game they wanted you know Randall Cunningham uh was my backup at the time in Dallas and I I never would I never went back and listened to broadcasts and I didn't that but I had a number of people tell me you know hey Tim Green was was on the broadcast. He was appalled by the fans' reaction, you know. And You have to remember who Troy Aikman is. The guy's been to six Pro Bowls. He's won three Super Bowls. And this offense was built for Troy Aikman. It's a timing offense. He's got three things going for him today. First of all, his offensive line has been playing pretty well. Secondly, the Cowboys are going to play it a little conservative early on. Run the ball, keep seven men in to give him a lot of protection to help him get into a rhythm. And then most importantly, this 49ers defense is the last in the league. The reason being, they're playing a lot of young players, especially in that secondary. Aikman should have some opportunities today. Frustration and, and you know, Troy Aikman's got to be angry at the way, you know, this is his home. I mean, he's been here for so many years and led this team to three championships and to have a crowd you know boo him when he comes back out onto the field is uh I, I think it's despicable to be honest with you i really do i mean he deserves a lot more respect than that and i and i've never had a chance to thank you for that but thank you so um you know tim came to my defense so i mean you you know how bad we were at that point in my career and and that and that Tim, quite honestly, that's why I retired because um, not because I got booed. I didn't care about any of that. But it was uh, it was just that I, I was done playing in Dallas because I knew that that they the, the the decisions weren't being made to give us a chance to be good and compete. And 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 I couldn't do anything about that. Um, I did consider. I almost went to San Diego. Uh, North Turner was the offensive coordinator there at the time. And I thought I was going to go. I had I had talked to my wife. She was on board with it. We were going to move to San Diego. I was going to give it another run. Uh, but if you remember, Buffalo that year had just released uh, Doug Flutie. They were trying to decide between Doug Flutie and Rob Johnson. They released Doug Flutie. San Diego signed Doug Flutie instead of me. And uh, and so that was. That was that was it. When North called me up and said, hey, just so you know, we just signed Doug Flutie. And the reason they signed Doug was because John Butler was the GM and he had been the GM in Buffalo. So he knew that one of those quarterbacks, either Rob Johnson or Doug Flutie, was going to be released and he was going to take whoever they released. And so he took Doug Flutie. Uh, they didn't have a spot for me. And that made my decision easy that uh, that I retired and, and then went into broadcasting, you know, and as far as if I regret uh, not playing longer, you know, I people ask me if I miss playing, Tim, and, and I don't. Uh, I never did. I never missed playing. What I did miss, I missed winning. 
because at the end of my career, I felt like I played and that wasn't a lot of fun. Uh, I missed playing in the championship games. I missed playing in the Super Bowls. I missed competing for division titles. And so I got, I was ready to move on when I got out. Uh, I did almost come back uh, a couple of years after retirement. I almost came back and signed with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, but in hindsight, I'm glad that didn't work out either. Uh, and, and the broadcasting has, has kept me busy and, uh, you know, it, it, it all worked out. You know, you always question some things along the way, but it all worked out fine. Was the Miami thing because Jimmy Johnson? No, Dave Wanstead was the head coach. North Turner, again, was the offensive coordinator there. And, and Dave met with me and said, uh, would you think about coming out of retirement? And I gave it some thought and talked to my wife and decided I would. And then nothing ever happened because Rick Spillman was the general manager and Rick was nervous about taking that leap of faith. So Rick Spillman, who then went on to the Vikings, uh, he, he couldn't pull the trigger. And it's probably best he didn't because the Dolphins felt like they had a really good defense. They felt they were a quarterback away from contending. And they really weren't. That, that next year, I think they won five or six games uh, the year that I would have been playing. They just – and so I, I remember that year watching them saying, man, I, that was, a, that was a, really a stroke of fate that I didn't sign with them because that wouldn't have turned out well either. I wasn't sure because I know at one point Jimmy almost went to the Dolphins. He was talking about going to the Dolphins or the box. He was in South Florida, but I wasn't sure. He did. Right. So Jimmy, when Jimmy left the Cowboys, he retired for two years and then he came out and he did coach the, he was at the Dolphins. But then when he, then he left, when he retired for good, uh, Dave Wanstead took over for him as Got the it. head. Coach. Okay. Yep. Yep. What was your, you had three Super Bowl rings. What was your, is there one that was your favorite or your, or your most proud of, or maybe it's the same game? Uh, the, the first Super Bowl is the one I'm, I'm mo it's the one that meant the most to me. Um, just that season in general meant, meant so much. Uh, I, you know, the first, you know, the first of everything is usually pretty special and sure. they were all special for different reasons, but that first one, we were the youngest team in football and we really, we knew we were a good team. We didn't know how good. And I don't think we saw ourselves as a team that would win the Super Bowl that year. I think we felt we were probably a year, maybe two years away. Um, so we were able to enjoy every win. You know, every win was was a big deal. It, every win felt good, you know. And then after you win it, then that becomes the expectation. And, you know, I've learned I've learned in life that expectations, uh, it's not oftentimes uh, – uh, expectations lead to disappointment and, and, and not that it was disappointing, but after that, but it wasn't nearly as much fun, uh, as the first run that we had. By the way, I didn't miss playing when I retired either. The Falcons were abysmal when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were abysmal until the, what, what year was it? 98. It was 98 when the, when they played the, the bird. Yeah. Yeah. That, but I hear you. <laughs> but Troy, you, got, you got to play with Dion. You got to, you got to you, Jerry Glanville and, you know, yeah. tickets for Elvis Presley and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Troy, what stuff are you working on today? What, what's, what are you excited about today? You're, you're a really competitive guy. You're one of the ultimate competitors. What's, what's uh, getting those juices flowing today? You've got eight, obviously you're, your company is that is that what you're spending most of your time on? Is that what gets you excited now? Yeah, that's uh, you know that's that's what I'm spending all my off season doing. Uh, we launched two years ago uh, in Texas. We just had a, we just launched last week in Oklahoma. Uh, so we're in we're in Texas and Oklahoma, just those two states. Um, and it's kept me it's kept me really busy. It's been a lot of work. Uh, it's it's been good. We're still building the the brand, and and we've got a long way to go and a lot of work ahead of us. But um, I worked in a distributorship in college and and learned a lot about the beer business then, and then became really close friends with a local distributor, uh, the family here in Dallas, um, 
over the years, done a lot with his distributorship and done some national campaigns. I, you know, I mentioned I, I, I like beer. Uh, I'm not a huge drinker, but I do like beer. And, uh, and so I wanted to make a beer that kind of fit my lifestyle that I, what I've been, what I was talking about earlier on this podcast that I just thought it could be done better. I thought it could be made cleaner and better for you. So went to work on it and, and eight was born and we're 90 calories, 2.6 carbs, uh, hundred percent organic grains, antioxidant hops, but we don't have any, any adjuncts or cheap fillers, which, which means we don't add any syrups or sugars uh, or sweeteners, corn, rice, uh, none of that stuff that every other beer on the market does. So it is truly the cleanest, uh, best for you beer available. And, sa- and, and we didn't sacrifice taste. So a lot of these light beers, they're pretty watered down. Uh, mine is not. Um, so I'm really proud of it. And we just continue to grow it, continue to expose it to, to people uh, that, wanna, that want something that's better for them. And I think that's the world we're in right now. You can go through any aisle in a grocery store and there's a better for you section within that aisle. Sure. And, and now there is within the beer cooler. I have heard you say how important being a father is to you. So here's your chance to brag about your girls. Yeah, uh, they're, Tim, like your kids are to you, they're, they're everything. Um, you know, I, I, I said in the, in, on the podcast that I, that I only wanted to be a professional athlete, you know, from the time I was young, you know, I also wanted to be a father. Uh, that was always really, really important to me. And I've got two daughters. Um, and as I said earlier as well, they're, they're the ones who tell our story. Uh, it's, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be read in the newspaper about my, my Super Bowls or my athletic career. It's going to be told by my kids. Um, and so I, if, if at the end of my life, my girls say, Hey, he was a great father. Uh, then, then my life is a success. Um, they're doing great. I've got a senior at Washington and Lee, uh, in Lexington, Virginia. My, my youngest daughter, they're 11 months apart. She's a junior locally here at SMU. They're both doing fantastic. Um, you know, they're kind of old school girls. I think I raised them a little bit like my, like my father raised me. I mean, they understand the, 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 what, what work means and, you know, you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, they treat people well. Um, I'm I'm real proud of them. So um, they're do, they're doing they're doing amazing. You know, I appreciate you asking me about them. Usually, when I talk about them, I get a little emotional, and I'm, I'm I made it through this without without choking up a little bit. But yeah, just proud proud of them, as I know you are yours. Troy Aikman, thank you so much for your time today. I know you don't particularly like being interviewed. And I know you agreed to because of our mutual friend, Joe Buck. So thank you. Tim, you are welcome. And I would say I, I did it because of you, not, not because of our mutual connection <laughs> with Joe. Um, Joe's the one who, who I didn't know you had a podcast. Joe, Joe reached out to me after he did it. And I guess, Troy, you had said, hey, you know, you'd like to get in contact with me. Um, but I hope you know this. I, I, I said it earlier. I have great respect for you. I feel like I know you way better than I do because of, because of Daryl Johnston and because of Mike Wojcik. Uh, yeah, I can't even begin to tell you how many times we would sit around and, and talk about y'all's days in Syracuse and, and Wojcik would always talk about how much you've meant to him and the books you've written and all that you've accomplished. I, I'm not joking when I, when you, you truly are a Renaissance man and there's not, there's not many like you. Um, so th- it's an absolute honor for me, Tim, to, to be on this podcast with you. And so great to see you. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm rooting for you and praying for you. And you've got a hell of a son here in Troy. So thank you for having me on. Troy, thanks for saying that. I'll send you the $5 like we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your kind words. Oh, thank you. Troy, one other thing before we let you go, and I know you got to go here, but one of the things we're trying to do is we don't want to make this an ALS podcast or a football podcast. It's just really interesting people and interesting conversations. Yeah. So who is somebody that you would say 
we should try to get on here who either has a great story and, you know, could tell a great story or maybe somebody who people haven't heard about. Who's somebody you think we should try to reach out to? Oh, man. You know, a guy who I think, um, and I don't have his contact information, but I'm, I'm sure you guys could. He just came to mind because I, I, I saw him in his retirement speech and stuff. Jason Kelsey. I think the guy's phenomenal. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you're just dealing with athletes or, or other people, but it's been, it's been a good mix, but he is a really interesting guy. Yeah. He's a, he's a, him and his, his brother had quite the, the run. <laughs> They're very different guys. And, uh, and Jason, you talk about a guy who wears his emotions on his sleeves, you know, I mean, he, he's a, he's a heartfelt guy, you know, he's the real deal. And, and, uh, he's got, I, I think he's really smart. Um, I, I think he would, I, I, if I had a podcast, I'd want him on my podcast. I know that we, we, we interviewed him for a production meeting and, uh, asked him something about if he might, I don't know, whoever influenced him or something. I, it was, it was not a question that I expected the reaction, but he started talking about his grandfather and I mean, he got, he got really choked up. Um, so. I, I think he's got a lot of depth to him that could be could be really good. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for the recommendation. Thanks for the time. It was a lot yeah. of fun. You guys are the best. This has been an honor for me. Tim, thank you, my man. At some point, you got to tell me some of those stories that I, I'm sure I haven't heard about. We'll have to we'll connect oh, yeah. offline. Yeah, we'll do, it, we'll do it around an eight beer. That'll be fun. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to barkleydamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.